Yeah. So today we're extremely happy to have Yassin Mitar Tani from Brookhaven um, National Lab. So fortunately in the hour before, we went through your entire um, academic history, so I don't need to uh, repeat that here. Um, but so Yassin <laughs> is known for um, working in a number of areas in theoretical PCD. And so in particular, he developed a lot of the techniques used to calculate jets um, in heavy ion. But today he's going to um, change it up a bit and talk about um, proton structure as relevant for the um, forthcoming electron ion collider. Um, so take it away. Thanks. So uh, yeah, before I start, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. It's uh, really great to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, I will talk today uh, about some work. The question that uh, somehow we actually, perhaps with the Honor Mustafa, with the professor at BNL a few years ago which uh, is uh, how to re reconcile our picture of the proton, which is based on the uh, partons, and another picture, which is another limit of uh, QCD, uh, a different regime of QCD, which is based on uh, strong fields, which is uh, the basis of our understanding of gluon saturation. So I'll come to that. So these two descriptions, two limits of QCD are kind of developed in a parallel using different techniques, uh, different uh, approaches, which seem uh, quite different. And the question is how to com combine and reconcile these two approaches. So, so this is uh, the outline of my, uh, my talk here. So I'll start with a brief review, just you know, set the stage, give the motivation, which I already uh, um, gave uh, my introductory slide. Uh, then I'll discuss this physics of gluon saturation that we are after. It's one of the goals of the uh, EIC program, science program, to probe this emerging phenomenon uh, in at high energy uh, collisions in, in protein. So then I will go and discuss our approach to connect these uh, two limits of QCD. And the byproduct of this uh, new uh, approach is uh, derivation of new uh, gluon distribution. So it's new operator to that uh, encompass information about the gluon structure within the proton. So it's a 3D distribution because it knows about the longitudinal structure of the proton and the transverse structure of the proton. And then I will uh, tell you a few words about why it is important to, to even think about this problem in the first place and how this relevant for uh, the uh, coming EIC. All right, so let me start with the uh, basics here. So we know that high energy, well, if you look inside the proton at very short distances, if you can do that, then you will see uh, that it's made of uh, weakly interacting uh, point like particles that we refer to as parton, parts and gluons. So of course, uh, this was uh, evidence came uh, from uh, the experiment deep elastic scattering in uh, the late 60s where we've clearly seen the emergence of such behavior that clearly the proton high energy seems to be made of free uh, quartz gluons. But we don't observe directly quartz and gluons, so we had to, of course, understand why they would be confined, and that came later with the theory of uh, quantum chromodynamics, which uh, with uh, the celebrated asymptotic freedom, we could understand, finally understand why short distances, distances much uh, smaller than the size of the proton, the uh, elementary constituents seem to behave freely, but over distances of the order of the proton, they need to confine because the interaction is so strong that they cannot really be pulled apart. Okay, so the, uh, the quantity here that's important here is this resolution scale, which I guess uh, a lot of us are familiar with. It. So this Q squared, which is uh, an, uh, an observable that's measured in the experiment, which can be directly related to the resolution at which we're going to probe the, the proton. And it's related to the momentum transfer. If you shoot an electron on the core and the, on the proton here, and then you measure the outgoing electron, that's it. You integrate over the final step, you don't measure anything else. Then the momentum transfer here between the electron and the, and the struck quark here is this uh, Q squared, which is related to the resolution scheme. So maybe just a few words here about the variables that we're going to use. So this is again the same diagram, but now we see that the electron has to interact uh, by an exchange of photon. That is an electromagnetic interaction. So and the momentum transfer Q is here. So the electron exchanges a photon with a proton, which is 
how of course this inelastic interaction produces a whole bunch of fine state that we don't measure. So we can separate this process into a leptonic part. This is here, this, this kind of structure, Lorentzian structure. You have a leptonic part, this is the upper part. And then you have the hadronic part, which we are interested in. So this is the part we, which, we don't, which will tell us about the structure of uh, the uh, probed object here. Then we can decompose it this way. That's the uh, rank two uh, hadronic tensor, which uh, is a function of two structure functions, which will, again, tell us about the inner structure of the proton. But the important point here is that it depends, of course, this, uh, these structure functions, F1 and F2, will depend on the momentum transfer, on the momentum of the, the proton. But of course, it has to be a uh, Lorentz invariant. So it will depend only on these two invariant Lorentz invariant quantities, which are again Q squared, which is momentum transfer, which measures the, uh, the which is a resolution at which you're going to measure the uh, signal structure. And on this variable X, X pure Kim, which as we see is later, well, is related to the longitudinal structure of the, uh, of the proton. Okay, so what is the framework that led to, to this uh, picture of partons? Well, at very high Q squared, this is where the part of the picture emerges based on the celebrated uh, uh, Q-Sleeve factorization. High Q squared, high energy, center mass energy being the center mass of the system here, a uh, photon, proton, when Q squared goes to infinity, S goes to infinity. So we're looking at really short distances, but keeping X, this ratio Q squared over S, fixed. X again, that's the variable I discussed. You do that, then you can factorize the hadronic observable to measure, which is again function of these two variables, Q squared and X, into a piece which is protonic that I can compute using perturbation theory. So I can just take my uh, theory QCD here and just expand in powers of the coupled constant. And this I know how to compute. So I compute the uh, uh, matrix elements of, of, uh, of quantities that I don't observe, which are quantum rules. But then there's a convolution in this variable X of a quantity, which is a quantum distribution function that encompasses physics at long distances. So this is a non-perturbative physics that I cannot compute. What I can, what I can study here by computing this, I know how these two quantities talk to each other via the message group, and that's how I will be able to make predictions, right? So what I can do is study this uh, factorization uh, data and extract this quantity from the data, which would be universal uh, uh, distribution that, uh, again, uh, describes the distribution of, of, of partners inside the, the proton. All right, so that's the quantity that we want to measure. And it has probabilistic interpretation. So we are measuring the probability to pick here a parton, a quark here, which has a longitudinal refraction of the proton momentum here, P, which is X, at a certain resolution scale, Q squared. All right. So this is. As I just mentioned here, in this limit, of course, uh, this is how the, uh, the, the, the dependence Q squared here becomes important. So depending on the, uh, the scale at which I'm probing the, the proton, I see a different proton, right? And the evolution or change with the scale is given by this uh, big lab evolution equations, which tell us, which is our perturbative uh, equations here, which tell us how this distribution changes with the resolution scale. And what typically happens is that at low scales, we don't see a lot of partons. This is what we see here at very low scales. It's basically, you have a larger uh, size objects, partons, which are a few of them. And then the higher the scale, the more and more phase space you open up for more and more uh, uh, partons uh, splittings here, which are resummed via this evolution equations. And the more and more uh, you will see uh, the larger number of partons you will see. So there are shorter, smaller objects you will see, but there are more of them. So the number increases uh, with, with the, the increased uh, resolution. What this equation is doing is resumming uh, this type of contributions. It's alpha s because each radiation here will come with a coupling constant, which is small, but then enhanced by a phase space uh, factor here, which is log of q squared over the uh, non perturbative scale on the QCD. So it's log of Q squared is very large, could be very large. That's why we need, this is a, 
this contribution needs to be resolved to, to all orders. And this is what you get. So now this is the state of the art. Uh, calculations have been done to very high order perturbation theory. That's next to next to next to leading order here. And uh, as you can see here, these are the distribution functions. So let me just comment a few, uh, about these two plots here. So this is the partnership function for the dance quarks, U and D, C quarks here, uh, C charm here, strange, and then the group. Right? So at high X, so this is for 2GV resolution, high X, well, you see that the distribution, the, the proton is dominated by balance quarks. So it's mostly U and D here, right? And it doesn't change much when you increase the, the, the resolution, but the, 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 the distribution changes a lot at low X. So you see the, this kind of rapid rise right, so of the distribution, in particular the gluon distribution, which is divided by five. So it, it, sh it shoots up uh, a lot more. Uh, so it was uh, reduced by five just to make it fit to the plot. So the message here is that at low X, physics seems to change, seems to see more and more soft. So the, the dynamics is dominated by very soft gluons, that we gluons that are more and more present in the uh, inside the program low X. All right, so there's more to the story. So this PDF uh, tells us uh, essentially the, the longitudinal structure of the protons, so how protons are distributed in the longitudinal direction. But we could learn more by studying the, the 3D structure and even beyond. So what you could you know, try to uh, investigate is the transverse motion of protons within the proton. So that's basically by studying the KT, uh, to the momentum of the uh, constituents. The impact parameter distribution, which is the distribution in the transverse plane here, this is uh, denoted by the uh, parameter B. How the spin is shared by the different constituents. This is another question, one of the main questions, in fact, of the uh, ESC science program. And of course, understand what happens in the soft sector. When we have more and more gluons, is it still uh, valid to speak about partons in the first place? So that's where gluon saturation will emerge. And even more prominently in the case of uh, nuclear. So there are many questions that uh, we can ask beyond the question of simply measuring or uh, fitting the uh, part and distribution functions. So, so we want to study this 3D uh, structure using different processes. So we have different processes that could allow us to access this uh, uh, different uh, dimensions of the, the proton, for instance, we can study form factors by just requiring elastic collisions between the electron and the proton, and then this will uh, somehow allow us to uh, extract information about the uh, transverse uh, uh, impact parameter distribution here. Then you can require measuring here, uh, say, a photon defined state that will allow us to access another, again, this longitudinal fraction of the momentum that's is access to the generalized partner distribution function, and so on and so forth. You can measure the KT to access the transit momentum distribution by requiring measuring of fine states and yet another quantity. So we can play with, around with observables and be able to map out the, uh, the internal structure of the problem. So this is roughly a uh, general idea of uh, what is the uh, state of the art, which is summarized here in this kind of family tree of distributions. So the mother of all the distribution would be some kind of bigger distribution, which knows about X, functional structure, KT, and BT. And this distribution would be related to the, all of the other distributions. For instance, by integrating over the impact parameter, we would have access to the transition momentum dependent distribution, which is only a function of X and KT, which is accessed by uh, some inclusive uh, observables, such as, for instance, acquiring measuring a jet in the final state in the circuit KT. Or, or head on the fact that this would uh, allow us to access this distribution. Again, if integrating over KT, then you get the, um, the PDF. Same here, integrating this distribution over KT, you get uh, the GPD. So you are reducing the space here. You, you get the uh, general Spartan distribution, which again integrated over X, you get access to from fact that are related by uh, integrations in, in, in some way or another. And the, of course, the goal is to be able to project out this distribution, which for the moment is still an elusive distribution. All right. So 
So the important picture is appealing. So we, we would like to be able to say, well, we have this kind of classical particle description of the proton. So we open the proton and it's just made of uh, well-identified point-like particles that are weakly interacting and then just study their motion within the, part, the, the inside the, 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 the proton, that should be it. But it's kind of limited beyond the, so the, 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 the part of the distribution function itself, which measures only the large neural uh, distribution. So going beyond measuring KT, there are more complications that come into play, and in particular at low resolution. So when we decrease the resolution uh, of, the, uh, of the, the, the process here, high density effect might become important. So we can't really ne neglect those effects anymore. We'll have uh, wider, uh, uh, longer uh, wavelengths, more overlapping between the different uh, particles, and then we can neglect them, in particular in the case of uh, nuclei. So the question is, can one still talk about particles at small x and, and also at large uh, mass number a or heavy nuclei? And if not, what are the uh, relevant degrees of freedom? So have you worried about uh, the future EIC? So, Hopefully, uh, there's a, a chance that it will be built uh, uh, in uh, around 2030 uh, in uh, PNL on the uh, current site of the uh, big, uh, ring here. And I wanted just to show you here the, uh, the, the, uh, the phase space that will be covered in Q squared and X of the AC. And as you can see here, that it will be able to reach values of X, which are are reasonably low and will allow us to access physics at small x and study uh, more uh, thoroughly. So you see here, root, root of s is about 140 here. And you see that you can access 10 to the minus 4 or q squared for around 10 ish here, which is pretty, it's not uh, the perfect scenario to study small x, but it's pretty uh, big reason. All right, so we understand the partons inside the proton, I think some extent, but do we really understand what happens with small x? And I think somehow this is still at somehow terra incognita. So what happens at small x? All right, so here's the picture, a cartoon, increase energy. So increasing energy, meaning to some extent, sort of decreasing x. So x is a function, inverse function of energy. And what happens there is that this is dominated by small by the small x gluons, the soft gluons. And although this uh, diagram seems to be uh, su suppressed by the coupling constant here, because the interaction here is, comes with the coupling here, because the number of gluons that you are proving here is so large, this diagram becomes dominant. Okay? And you can think of it this way. So think of this gluon here as being just some kind of gauge field, some kind of uh, gluon field times the coupling g, which is of order one, in which case, even if g is small, this is of order one. So soft nuance dominant dynamics, and this is the diagram that dominates. So typically what happens here is that you have a photon that interacts with uh, C quarks inside the proton and, and, and by the exchange here also of, of a blue one. Now, when you decrease even x even further, to start up no up phase space for further radiation. And this is the typical probability for such an event to happen, which is again alpha s times large logarithms of kt and x. But we will focus on x here because that's what will be important at small x. So when x is small, you have a large logarithm for one over x, and this needs to be resumed. So you start radiating more and more blue ones. And if you resum, then you get this kind of exponential growth of the blue one number inside. Be uh, the proton. This is what happened. Until a point where gluons start overlapping. We have so many gluons inside the proton that they start overlapping in the transverse uh, direction. And this means that the probability that the root combination is no longer uh, negligible. And this is the, the, uh, the physics of uh, gluon saturation. So, nonlinear uh, dynamics that is usually uh, neglected in the context of uh, the part in the uh, picture important picture that weak interactions that don't recombine. So it's only linear dynamics. But this nonlinear dynamics happens, is expected to happen at small x when you have enough gluons to uh, pack inside the proton. And at some point, 
you will reach saturation. So this is so-called blacklist limit. So typically what happens here is that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the probability for interaction is one. So it's you reach, you saturate unitarity here. And this is a type of diagram you should uh, you know, picture. So it's interactions, multiple interactions that cannot be uh, ignored. And, and this is what, this is the regime of saturation which is described by strong classical fields. So what is the simple, uh, this is just a simple back of the envelope criterion to see how, when this happens, when does this saturation happen? So when you multiply the number of gluons by the gluon activation cross-section, is given by this formula here, the number of gluons inside the exoton times this recombination cross-section G squared over Q squared, when this becomes of the order of the transition area of the proton, this is when you expect saturation to happen. And from this equation, you see the appearance of a scale, which is uh, referred to as the saturation scale. So just plugging here, saturation scale, you solve for this implicit equation, and you see that the saturation scale will, is proportional to the gluon distribution uh, divided by G squared uh, and by the transition area. And it scales like A to the one third. So it's enhanced for heavy nuclei. And it's also uh, enhanced by at small x, so it's one over x to some power, positive power uh, lambda here. So it's it's enhanced with at small x and for large nuclei. So this leads us to this picture, kind of a QCV uh, to the uh, plane here for uh, the, the log one over x and log q squared uh, plane here. And you see here, so uh, increasing q squared, you uh, increase resolution, you see more and more particles, but they don't really uh, interact much. That's the standard D-Lab resolution. But fixing Q and varying X, what happens is that the size of your objects is the roughly uh, unchanged, but the number increases ra rapidly until you hit this saturation line, which is uh, a line in the uh, log-log scale here, uh, which, uh, uh, which is simply uh, represents the saturation scale. And this is where saturation happens. And this was studied uh, extensively in the past, uh, say, 30 years with new evolution equations that describe the evolution of the gluon density uh, across this line here. So the relevant degrees of freedom in this case are no longer partons. So these are strong fields, as I said. They, they, they scale like one over G, much uh, larger than one. And in this regime, saturation regime, the important picture breaks down because we have long uh, wavelengths overlapping uh, fields, so we can't really talk about three partons. That's so a quantum mechanics become important here. And in this case, we have to go beyond the, the so-called leading power. So this limit where Q goes to infinity, where we neglected powers of one over Q to get this nice QCD localization, which uh, led to the parton picture needs to be relaxed, and we need to worry about powers uh, of QS over Q, particularly when Q is of order uh, QS. So QS increases, Q decreases, and this could be of order one, and also powers of your parameters. So this is kind of the uh, general uh, picture of saturation and how it compares to the partner model. But the question is, we have two descriptions of QCD, how uh, we can connect this to that's still, still uh, an open question. All right, so let's see how much time we'll I have left. So, uh, 25 minutes. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. So, so Al Muir in the 90s uh, studied this, uh, was one of the uh, initiator of this physics. And he realized that basically at high energy, the best picture to kind of understand what's, what's happening uh, at small x is this one. So, instead of looking at a photon that exchanges here uh, momentum with uh, the blue ones in the, uh, the target here, by uh, the, uh, this uh, C quark fluctuation, the best way to see it is to boost the system, look at the high energy limit and view the interaction of photon, which is basically has a log dominant uh, longitudinal uh, momentum and interact with the proton via the splitting into QQ bar pair that forms way before the interaction takes place. So there's a fluctuation, QQ bar pair, which is frozen in time. So we now have a QQ bar pair that forms uh, early uh, before interaction. And then the interaction here happens quasi instantaneously. So there's a separation of scales. So typically at high energy, the time scale for fluctuation is much larger than interaction time. And this becomes important 
in the saturation regime, and it's regularly limit when Q squared is much smaller than S, where density effect becomes important. So one glue one won't do it. We need to worry about the exchange of many, 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 many glue ones here. While in the other limit, partonic limit, single glue one is enough because the system is dilute, as I said. So the uh, just a word on the, uh, the uh, variables we use here. So this is a picture of the same interaction on the light gun. So the photon would move on the light gun. The energy is so high that its momentum is close to the light gun. And we usually use the uh, light gun variables, x plus, that defines that are defined on the light gun, x plus and x minus. And the, uh, the proton here is taken to be moving in the minus z direction on this uh, branch of the light gun and the photon on the other. And the interaction here is, again, quasi uh, instantaneous. So again, here you see clearly what happens. So the photon splits and it evolves with time and X plus will uh, represent here the light gun time. So it's good to think of X plus as a time variable on the light gun. So, the, so it splits at a certain X plus time and then it moves and then it hits the target, which interaction is quasi instantaneous and then it continues until uh, it's either observed or the fluctuation goes back into a photon. So these are the variables. So Q plus is the momentum of the photon and square root of S over two. The proton momentum is square root of S over two and the, the, uh, the, the invariant Lorentz invariant is Q plus times P, which is uh, the uh, center of mass energy square. Uh, sorry, naive question. Mm -hmm. So you said the interaction is quasi instantaneous with uh, one of the, the Q or the Q bar that the originating by the photon, right? But, but if they're traveling on the light cone, isn't time dilated? So how is that instantaneous? So the, the photon here suffers time dilation, okay. all right? In the direction X plus. Yeah. So it's frozen in time, right? Fluctuation can happen anytime before the interaction, it's frozen in time. By the time it interacts with the uh, the proton, so it would see the interaction as was instead in the direction x plus. The proton is Lorentz contracted, right, in this direction x plus, which is a way of understanding the interaction, or at least interpreting the interaction as being quasi instantaneous. So it's just comparing time scales. So the time scale of the photon, because it uh, has time dilation, right? It moves very slowly and it interacts. And during the interaction, it, nothing happened. Or the, imagine, for instance, if another fluctuation, a gluon radiated here, it will go through the, the, the target here without barely moving in the transit plane. It's very frozen. All of, the, all of the particles that would cross the proton here would be frozen in the transverse. There's no dynamics. There. So when you calculate, is it interacting with each? There are multiple blue ones? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And to describe that, we need an object called Wilson line. So Wilson line is basically just the building block of this type of dynamics in the limit, in the Regia limit, which is when S is much larger than T. When S is much larger than T, you need this object. And what this object is doing is simply resumming multiple soft interactions. And it's just a color procession. So this quark doesn't move. It's frozen while traveling inside the target. It doesn't move. So the transverse coordinate doesn't change. There's no dynamics for the quark. But it will re receive a phase, a color phase here, which is uh, encoded in this, uh, in this Wilson line here. All right? It what it does is just leading to color procession. But it resums multiple scatterings. But what it does, even though it doesn't change the transverse coordinate, it still transmits some transverse momentum. That's also another important thing. So it just resums multiple scatterings, just basically multiple scatterings. Although the momentum transfer is still much smaller than the momentum of the high energy particle, which is the quark here. And this is the picture that you know we just showed. So the photon splits into QQ bar pair way before the interaction, and then the quark and the, the antiquark are frozen in the transverse uh, space. And then they just go and receive this kind of phase uh, recession here uh, while going to the, uh, the target. That's it. And the interaction is coherent, of course, because the uh, formation of the, uh, the photon, it takes so long, and the interaction happens with all of the scattering centers at once. So it doesn't see the 
uh, let's say, the details of the longitudinal structure, just sees one interaction at once. So, and given those uh, considerations, we get to this factorization formula, which is orthogonal to the QCD factorization. What we have here, we have a hard matrix element, which comes from just, the, which describes the splitting of the photon into QQ bar before it hits the interaction, which is function again of this transverse uh, size of the dipole, N of Q. And then you'd have this dipole operator, which is just two Wilson lines, two point correlation function Wilson lines here, traced over color here, and uh, of course evaluated on the proton state. That's the operator that will describe the gluon distribution uh, in the in the in the target. But of course, if you have higher order fluctuations, say radiate gluons, uh, the, 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 the photons between QQ bar plus a gluon, and so on and so forth, then you'll have an arbitrary number of high energy particles that will cross the uh, the uh, the target, and then a general operator would be an endpoint uh, correlation of Wilson lines here, which, as opposed to the standard QCD factorization, resumes all orders in the, uh, the, the 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 dipole size of the transverse distance, which translates into all orders in the power of one over the resolution, but it's leading power in the energy, so it's a different thing for QCD. To be contrasted with this. In the QCD factorization, what we had, it was leading power in one of the Q. Leading power, we had short distance matrix element times the probability to measure a parton with his on shell, you can just interpret it as an on shell parton, no KT, no momentum, not no transverse momentum exchange, while we had transverse momentum exchange in the previous picture. And here we have separation of short distance and long distance physics, which is encoded in uh, by local operators which have no transverse structure whatsoever. So it just measure here field, your uh, fermionic field, your quark field, at the same transverse position as, uh, but at two different uh, longitudinal uh, times, which simply translate to, uh, which are just uh, conjugate to the uh, variable X, which is the longitudinal momentum transfer. The same for blue ones here. If you want to measure blue ones, you go one uh, order higher, alpha S, you get this box diagram, which is again, the same diagram as I was showing before, but drawn differently, you have a photon splitting QQ bar directly with one blue one here, then here you get uh, this uh, operator, which is different. So it looks different, right? So we have, we have two distributions, which look quite different. One, which is evaluated at zero transverse distance. There's no transverse structure because as I said, R per to zero corresponds to one over Q to zero, Q to infinity. That's uh, the, the short distance limit. It's oh. one PDF. And then we have, we, we extract two uh, transversely polarized gluons from the, uh, the target. That's, that's the, the PDF. The PDF is two uh, physically polarized gluons. While the dipole distribution is evaluated at x equals to zero, but all R perp. So this one is R perp equals to zero, but all x is, but here x equals to zero. So it's really soft gluons, very soft, x is zero, but it measures a certain transverse distance so why we measure transverse distance? Because the photon had time because it was produced uh, early uh, before the interaction happened. So the pair had time to explore via quantum Brownian motion to explore the transverse space. And when it hits the target, it had a certain finite size from the size. So we have two different uh, distributions. But how do they relate to each other? So that's the, 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 really the, uh, the motivation of this work, to try to find an overarching scheme that allow us to be able to describe both this regime of QCD where uh, gluons can saturate and the, the limit where uh, we, we, we get the discrete part of the uh, description. Somehow this is akin to the uh, wave particle duality. So we have uh, classical fields in one end and classical particles on the other. So you could say, well, I could start from this limit, particles, and just expand in whatever parameter I have. So let's say, I had the lead, lead, leading power, I go to the next power, one over Q to some next power, that's next twist. But what happens is that I'm just expanding around this region, Not, nothing, like, I, sh I shouldn't expect anything new to happen uh, besides uh, somehow you know, stumbling into uh, many new uh, operators and increasingly uh, more uh, complicated to, to compute. The same happens when I expand around this limit. If I expand around this limit here, I get more and more sub 
corrections, which are difficult to compute. And as we know, the, if you try to uh, perform an expansion, systematic expansion in a certain parameter, the, 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 the higher up we go in the expansion, the more complex we have, the, the, we, the, the, the calculation is. And in terms of new physics, we don't expect anything new. What we need to do is to understand, to perform a certain resummation of a subset of contributions, not all of them, the ones that are relevant to go from this limit to the other one. And that's the task. So that's the idea. How can we achieve such an interpolating scheme that allows us to resum the right, just the right powers of one over Q squared that allows me to go to the powers of one over S that allow me to go from this region to this one, or the right powers of one over Q squared that allow me to go from this to the uh, to the uh, to the saturation region. So this is just rephrased here in this slide here. So we have Q squared here on this line. S is the larger scale, and Q squared is a sliding scale here. At some point, Q squared around here, we are in the regime, partonic regime. So we know that the leading power is one over one over Q squared. So I'm, I don't need to worry about higher powers. When Q squared decreases and I get closer to the saturation scale, then I need to worry about higher powers. But by the time I hit the scale, one over S is another small parameter. So around this scale, one over S is a small parameter. Around this scale, one over Q squared is a small parameter. The only thing I need is to have the right combination of powers that allow me to make sure that I have both limits right. Of course, there's a caveat. We need to make sure that in between, we are not, the, the interpolation still makes sense. But this can be systematically uh, somehow under control uh, improvable because we have a systematic approach to compute corrections which are in any case suppressed in either one over Q squared or one over S. Okay, so that's the idea. So kind of revisiting high energy factorization, where instead of having a factorization in Q squared or a factorization in one over S, we would have a convolution of distributions which are dependent on both X and transition moment. So this kind of double uh, factorization would be would resum to all orders the right terms up to powers that are suppressed in either limits. So when x Bjorken is small, this is suppressed. When q squared is small, this is this is suppressed. And then you can go from the, such an overarching scheme where you have have a transverse dependent uh, distribution here and the hard metric element by simply assuming that kT is small. Right, so this is the twist expansion. And if you do that, you can integrate over KT on the right side and you get the PDF. So that's a standard PD, uh, the QCD factorization. And you get up to one over Q squared. Here, integrating, setting X equals to zero in the distribution, you can integrate X, uh, the, you can integrate over here the uh, hard matrix element, and then you get back the high energy factorization. So we would have uh, this kind of overarching factorization of uh, this uh, to, uh, object here. So in the uh, next, uh, I guess, 10 minutes or so, yeah, let me just show that. So this is the idea. I'm not going, I'm trying not to go into much details, technical details, just to present the idea and at least convey you now the, uh, the essence uh, of uh, our approach. So in principle, it's a general idea, but we want to test it against observables to see whether it works, right? So of course, obviously you want to start uh, with the, uh, the the observable that uh, is the, 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 the standard one, which is the VIS, inclusive VIS, in the small x. So we want to start from the small x uh, picture, which is the one that is dominated by gluon. So this is the type of observable we want. So photon splits into QQ bar, interacts with many gluons with the target, and then uh, merges back into a photon. So taking the cut here gives us the inclusive uh, VIS cross section. So it's all about here, going from one limit to the other, it's all about understanding what's happening in a transverse plane. So the quark, when in general, when the quark traverses the medium here, which is uh, the field of the, 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 the proton here, it could explore the transverse space, right? There's this kind of transverse Brownian motion. So we go like this. This is standard quantum Brownian motion, and then it will interact with the, with, the, with the target. So you have a certain propagator here that you need to calculate. It's complicated. So what you can do, say, well, uh, do I really need all of this dynamics? I know that because of Lorentz interaction, this 
uh, interact this kind of um, uh, Brownian motion is not so important. What the, at the end of the day, the uh, the, the quark won't explore uh, the, the large uh, region of transit space, so I can expand around the uh, classical trajectory. And this is what uh, we did. So we'll just ex expand here the fields around the classical trajectory, and then what you get uh, the, 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 the final propagator here is simply uh, the quantum phase times again the Wilson line because that's what you get. You have a classical straight line trajectory which resums this phase um, the, uh, the the color precession to Wilson line up to powers of the transverse separation x minus y divided by the uh, position of uh, of this uh, object here. All right. So you're going to ask, well, did people do that before or not? What's the difference? Well, the difference is that here we are expanding in twists. We're expanding in transverse space. Why in the limit, small x limit, what is the standard approach is to take p plus to infinity, which amounts to taking this size to zero. It's called the shockwave approximation, in which case you get, instead of the phase, you get a delta function. You get the same Wilson line, but you get a delta function telling you that y is exactly equals to x. That's the fact that it's frozen. In this approach, it's still frozen, right? Except you uh, get this, this phase, which tells you that there is some phase that is inherited due to the fact that there is some quantum dynamics in the transverse plane. And you can see how this is just a, represent, a representation of the delta, delta function. You just take p plus to infinity, and then when you take p plus to infinity, you get the delta function. So it's peaked around x close to one. And this is exactly the phase that will give the x dependence. Anyway, so this is one thing. The other thing is to say, well, we need to see the appearance of field strength tensors. So we had Wilson lines, but how to see field strength tensors uh, emerging? Well, that's, uh, you, you can do that by uh, relating the Wilson line to uh, an exponential field strength tensor using the non abelian Stokes theorem. So basically, this uh, line integral here on this uh, path here, this is again the dipole, it's x1, x2, so maybe there's a dipole, x1, x2, this is the dipole, and then you have a Wilson line that runs around this contour here, this is simply equal to the exponential of this surface uh, integral, where now the, the field strength tensor is not measured along the path here, but inside the surface, right, and the appearance of the field strength tensor, of course, it's called twisted field strength tensor because it's dressed with Wilson lines because of the non nonlinear nature, then allows you to make a connection directly to partons because expanding this object without even before doing any twist expansion, you see it. That twist expansion is just expanding in the transverse distance. You see how you're going to generate all kinds of operators. Operators that are uh, at leading power are simply FF. Let's put it this way, just FF that you need to get the, the, the dipole, uh, the, the, the blue one distribution. So, okay, so uh, using this IDS, uh, doing some math, you get this uh, factorization formula for the uh, the photon cross section. Again, it's function of x zero again x squared. The details are not important. What's important here is to say that well, we get this hard matrix element which describes the again the photon splitting here, which is similar to what you would get when doing just small x standard high energy factorization. Nothing changes. The only difference is that now you have a constraint on um, that relates the transverse coordinate with the longitudinal coordinates. That's the difference. And then you get um, a blue one distribution, which is uh, the byproduct here. So there's a kind of a new uh, high energy factorization formula where you get a new gauge invariant blue one distribution that depends explicitly on the momentum, trans momentum exchange here and the X. And it, it uh, as opposed to the, the standard uh, low X approach, it uh, encompasses the line. So this is the shape of the form of this gluon distribution. Uh, again, the exact uh, details of this equation are uh, this formula are not very important. What's important is at least how, what it looks like in, in terms of uh, the confidence that uh, it is built. So you have the field strength tensor, but instead of having two field strength tensors at two different times, but at equal terms versus uh, position as you get for gluon distribution, here you have also dependence on the transverse. So you have to integrate over the possible positions of the field strength and over the segment in the transverse plane. And in between, you have to connect them with gauge links to make it gauge invariant. So basically, it's just a, a Wilson loop 
but uh, a kind of derivative of Wilson with respect to the longitudinal uh, direction. And uh, it, it, it accounts, it, it encompasses physics longitudinal and the transverse uh, physics. And you can see here that you have this kind of phase factor <laughs> that relates the longitudinal two part correlation, correlation function here in the longitudinal direction. Uh, to, to this kind of time separation to the x variable and then the r perp separation to the kt uh, of the, uh, the momentum exchange. All right, so I'm almost done with this, but we need to uh, check the limits. Now, the Bjorken limit, which is the limit where q goes to infinity, which corresponds to the limit where r perp goes to zero, or in other words, integrating over kt. If I integrate over kt, my blue one distribution, in coordinate space, it, it leads to uh, a delta function of R perp, and then that just collapse the transverse uh, dimension. Just collapses. So the two field strength times, so I still measured at two different light cone times like this, but they are uh, at, measured at the same transverse coordinate. And that's the definition of the V1 PDF. So we see that this is the distribution that covers the North PDF. So uh, even better, now if you go back to uh, the full um, cross-section, you can show that in that limit, you recover the full uh, one loop result for the gluon-mediated DIS, basically this diagram, which people have computed before in comp using completely different techniques, using just the standard Feynman rules in the uh, covariant space, momentum space. So you, you, can, you get this result. And we were able to, uh, to obtain this result using this uh, background field method uh, while, of course, we summing multiple scatterings or, take, uh, or, or uh, multiple powers of one over Q squared, but taking the limit Q squared to infinity, we, uh, we were able to recover this uh, uh, leading twist result where you see the gluon distribution times the uh, collinearly enhanced uh, singular term here. As you can see, this is the alta really Paris splitting function. That's the term that uh, needs to be subtracted into uh, or absorbed into the evolution of the gluon distribution. And this is the finite uh, term piece here, which is alpha is uh, suppressed. And that's the true result for the one direction. So that's encouraging. It means that we have a technique that uh, does what it is supposed to do. And uh, of course, when I set x equals to zero, that's the other limit. That's where saturation emerges. The gluon distribution collapses to the dipole uh, operator. So x equals to zero, I need to put x equals to zero, otherwise I, I cannot get that. So we get the dipole operator. All right, so to summarize, so we have this interpolating scheme for DIS, but not only. Uh, I didn't mention other applications such as uh, DVCS or uh, TCS or exclusive processes, but focusing on this, we have this kind of uh, generalized factorization in both transverse and longitudinal space, which yields the uh, in two different limits the uh, correct uh, large q squared limit and large s limit as I, uh, I I mentioned before and with this framework in principle we should be able to study the regime partonic regime in this limit here as well as the limit where saturation sets in where we need uh, which requires uh, higher uh, twist or higher insertions of the uh, of the gauge field all right um, as a conclusion, let me just say why this is relevant. So this is a, um, a theoretical question. We, we made a, a little progress uh, trying to uh, bridge the, these two limits of PCD, but why is it important? Well, well it's important because uh, where well, there's a lot of uh, activity trying to uh, first uh, understand the physics uh, the behavior of uh, try to prove saturation at small x, but also understand the structure of nuclei where high density effects are even more prominent. So such an approach can help have better control over uh, the, uh, the high density effects uh, that uh, are uh, generated by power corrections uh, to probe the parting contact of nuclei. So for instance, here in this plot, you see this uh, ratio of structure functions in, uh, in nuclei over uh, proton, and you see that it doesn't look the same at high Q squared. So there is something, the shape of the distribution of particles is not the same. So you try to understand that this is in particular here at small x, you see this kind of called shadowing effect, where it's suppression of uh, low x gluons in, in nuclei as, as compared to protons. 
and uh, this this approach could help uh, figure out how this happens. Um, the A dependence of observables that's important. Here, for instance, there's a recent measurement of uh, dipion uh, uh, forward dipion production in proton uh, nucleus collisions uh, star, where they observed uh, this kind of uh, azimuthal correlation here that you know somehow is disappearing here because of the effect of multiple uh, interactions, and they could uh, somehow extract an A dependence of this distribution, and that's remarkable. So we need to understand from first principle uh, this uh, this type of, of uh, features. Uh, the other point is that there's a lot of activity at small, in this region, small x, uh, beyond what we did, well, I want to say beyond, before what we did, where uh, it was very uh, quickly, re re uh, they realized that at next to leading order, some very uh, strange features arise. For instance, uh, some of the analog calculations led to negative cross sections and so on and so forth. This was fixed. So this is the negative cross section for forward hydrogen production p -like, And it was fixed later on, but at the cost of imposing a kinematic constraint a posteriori. So it's not a first principle approach, but it works, it's fixed. But the question is whether we can have an approach and that's the motivation also of this work to be able to have a first principle fix of these uh, issues. The other thing here, this is a, a fit to, uh, BIS structure functions at low X done again using nonlinear evolution at NLO. And again, you see it has to stop at certain X, X 10 to the minus two. But, the, but there is a dependency here on where you start the evolution. So it depends on where, this is uh, shown here, you need to start your description of so below certain X, and there is a strong dependence. Although you fit the data here, you want, you know, my view, well, there is a dependence on certain X, which where probably the partonic picture become important. So knowing how smoothly uh, interpolate, I think that's uh, that's important, uh, especially when we uh, we aim for high precision. All right. So this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so understanding the emergence of gluon saturation from uh, the partons uh, is crucial. So we, the, the parton picture, is well understood, but we don't know from first principle how we can go from partons uh, to, to saturation uh, in a smooth way. So that's very important if you want to have uh, a comprehensive picture of uh, your structure. So what we did here is that we have developed the minimal factorization scheme using an approach which we dubbed the partial twist expansion that allowed us to resub just the right terms to all orders that allow us to go from one limit to another. It's like a double point expansion. We we're able to do that, which can be systematically improvable. So we can compute higher uh, powers per terms doing so. Uh, uh, with the out of court, we'll generate more complex uh, operators. But investigating this leading power kind of quote unquote leading power, it's all powers like leading uh, power in the combined powers would be already interesting. So first application is looking at DIS, and we showed that this is semi to check that we could reproduce the one loop result by expanding a leading power of Q squared. And we could also uh, match up to the, uh, the, the small x limit. Uh, what we, the byproduct again, this is a novel gauge invariant 3D uh, gluon distribution, which uh, depends ex explicitly on x and k burp, and which would be interesting to uh, investigate both analytically and in the future on the lattice. So the outlook here we're working on is uh, quantum evolution of this uh, gluon distribution. And we already have something in the result. We showed that indeed the schematic constraint that was imposed uh, a posteriori to fix certain issues is or is built in. So it's really uh, important to was important to see that um, and investigate all other observables such as digit production uh, in electron uh, ion collisions and uh, to kind of uh, set the stage for uh, more uh, for precision phenomenology. Uh, that would encompass the two limits of QCD, small x and, and the, the, the moderate x where a uh, partner swims. And if I can get to up here. Thank you. Thanks for your great talks. Are there any questions for Yassine? Yeah, you know, maybe I'll start off with one while other people think. So maybe I just missed it, but do you talk at all about the renormalization group structure of this G of X and K per, or is this something that's understood? Like, does it evolve in both variables or have you computed this or? Not yet, this is ongoing work. So okay. it's what I uh, refer to as a uh, quantum evolution. Okay. 
So for the moment, this is a leading order factorization, which in principle should be understood as an all order if the structure is right. But we haven't yet investigated the, 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 the uh, okay, okay. structure. Okay, okay. Cut, so we, we don't, we, I, don't, I don't know yet how this, but the structure of the, this uh, distribution, at least at small f, seems to follow the standard BK evolution. Okay. Beyond that, we that, that's an open question. Okay. Okay. I think Helen has a question. Hi, Yasin, it's Helen. Sorry to not be there in person. Uh, so you mentioned sort of in part of the motivation of your talk that we're, that we're looking for the gluon saturation. And then you brought in the idea of there being a black disc limit. And this was discussed a bit at Quark Matter recently. I'd always thought that the black disc limit was sort of the more naive picture of gluon saturation and gluon saturation got you to a black disc limit but have i thought incorrectly should i be thinking of these two limits as something no, I, different? right right no you, you, you you're right i mean this is just a naive picture it's just a way of picturing uh roughly what's going to happen when you reach that unitarity limit of course the question whether you, you reached or not at what's and speed you would reach that, that's a different question. Reality saturation sets in before you reach the unitarity limit. But that's some kind of just a picture to show that there is such an ideal limit, which is called black, black disk limit, where the probability of the dipole to interact with the, with the target is one. So there is no escape. Um, so I should yeah, think saturation, of saturation, of course, would... goes beyond that. It's not just the black disk limit. It's not just always, is it sort of the, then the intermediate state that I sort of hit gluon saturation and then the black disk limit or are they sort of different pictures that in principle or hopefully experiments can distinguish between as two different pictures? Right, so I can go back to this, uh, let me see here, this line. Yeah. So, uh, so you see, before even hitting the saturation scale, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the nonlinear physics sets in before, right? So you start being sensitive to this saturation boundary already a few times you know, above the saturation scale. This is called the geometric scaling window. And people have studied that and there's a mapping with the uh, reaction diffusion equation. So saturation starts happening even in a regime where you don't expect it to happen. So this is the effect of recombination. Now, the black disk limit is just a naive picture to say that deep inside the saturation regime, right, then you have some kind of a black disk. But saturation is all of the physics that start happening way beyond, uh, way before uh, you reach that black disk. Limit. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any others? Uh, uh, maybe a different type of question. So is there anything that you think would be good to learn from Rick before EIC comes on 10 years? Well, I think- I think do, cal do calculations or anything that won't get that? Right. Well, I think really uh, investigating the, uh, the proton nucleus process in, in a more and try to uh, connect that with sort of, sort of similar observers in the ESC. So start preparing, you know, understanding what it says in jet production. Okay? Jet production. So we know that the uh, the jet would go through nuclear matter. What's going to happen there? Uh, more precision uh, uh, predictions, precision uh, uh, also maybe uh, uh, measurements uh, in preparation for similar observables in ESC, which will certainly be uh, measured. So. Uh, so again, uh, dihydrogen uh, correlators and so on and so forth. In fact, people are using the same framework to compute observables in the forward direction, p led as in uh, uh, pro uh, electron uh, nucleus. It's just the initial, initial stage, uh, state, which is the, in fact, p led is a little bit more complicated because the, the, you know, the colliding system is more, uh, you know, you have two uh, non perturbative objects that collide, but we can learn a lot. Is there anything that you won't learn at EIC that you should do at Rick? Either polarization. Yeah, polarization, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Anything that would uh, be sensitive to the, the thought on project type, uh, such as structure of overflow. Yeah, overflow, or how, you know, hydronization in, in proton uh, could, could be different. That's, that's a, yeah, hydronization could be different. Right. If there's any correlation with the initial state, then we have to worry about that, especially with the time state interaction. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I guess I have more like a conceptual question. Uh, so, uh, in a lot of these uh, diagrams, you have like a virtual photon and then the proton interacting with uh, uh, via the exchange of the gluon. So, uh, how do you like sort of remove the backgrounds where like you have electron interacting with proton via just a photon exchange? And in that other words, there's no gluon being the propagator. I mean, just, just a quark, or I mean, just a quark, or uh, it would be a photon, wouldn't it? Like electron, proton, uh, what's uh, all right, right. just a photon interacting with the quark, right? Yeah, like, right. What would you like? Does, does it require like to measure the channel you suggested? Does it require like? Uh, tagging like a J side production. You could do that. It. Yes. Yeah. But with do exclusive uh, processes, then you would tag on you know specific you know uh, channel. Yeah. Uh, you could, uh, but but really the, the point here is that at small x, right? This is the first step. We should worry about all of the channels eventually, right? In 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 a, in a more uh, you know somehow general approach. Uh, but at low x, you expect the, uh, the, uh, the, the this channel, you know, the gluon mediated channel to dominate. So we so we were just thinking of you know just kind of uh, idealization that the target is gluonic, and we solve the problem there. Going to you know including you know all the channels, we we hope that we won't encounter any you know substantial difficulties to kind of uh, wrap things up, right? But uh, this is the an open question. So first set the stage, you know, to understand what's happening from one channel, and then make sure those channels become important at high X. Yeah. So I guess, like, how do you identify from an, uh, like, from an experimentalist point of view, how do you identify if an event is of high X or low X? Like, how do you remove the high X background sort of? Oh, the X is uh is measured, right? That's broken X. Oh. Right. That's it. So this is the energy of the collision, so to speak. If you have Q squared in the uh, center of mass energy, uh, then that tells you what's the, uh, the, the X. And if X is small, then you have a large phase space for this uh, channel to, to occur. Okay, and then, and then like for small X, uh, the gluon exchange channel would dominate over no gluon exchange. Right. Okay. Right. But you you you, are, you kind of see it here, right? In the in this PDF. Oh, sorry. In the uh, here you can see it. So the PDF fits here. So so you see this is the gluon divided by five, right? So it's small x already at ten minus two. And you see that you have mostly gluons. In, in your target. So they're really overwhelming you when you reach this X of 10 to minus two. And most of the, you know, frame, you know, the, the theoretical discussions or calculations are done below this 10 to minus two. So you see this 10 to minus two is exploding here. And then I showed here uh, in the last slide, uh, a fit using small X framework here, this one. So then X broke in 10 minus two and below. So uh, I guess X you can measure by the electron kinematics, but that's not something you could do at Rick with P, P, A, right? Right, so now, you have, yeah, exactly. So you have to measure fine state, whether it's a jet or that will set the kinematic. So it's gonna be forward production of whatever you wanna measure. So high rapidity, you measure for the atom or jet. It, it doesn't give you like an exact uh, measurement of X as 
But as the electron kinematics. Yes, right? it's not an exact measurement, but it's it's, it's correlated. Okay. Yeah. So large rapidity is correlated with small x in the in the uh, nucleus. If you look at the uh, away away from the gravitation region of the nucleus. So maybe other questions can be done in the meeting this, uh, this afternoon. So let's thank Yasin again for the great talk.